Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'll have to apologize ahead of time. I'm a little bit scratchy today. Uh, hope you all are safe uh, and home with family. Uh, today, we're going to go over the Pacific Northwest. We're going to focus, obviously, on uh, the states of Washington and Oregon. We have a little bit of Idaho that we'll discuss here and there. Uh, but we're going to get right into it uh, and take a look at some things. So we start in uh, the state of Washington. This is the Guild Psalm map. We're going to also take a look at some of the Wine Folly maps, too. Um, certainly appreciate uh, what both of those entities do for us when it comes to studying. Uh, I think it's important to note, uh, of course, the Cascade Mountains uh, acting as the rain shadow and then eastern Washington as the important, most important growing regions here. Uh, as we move further south in Oregon, you'll find that the Willamette Valley is on the western side of the Cascade Mountains. We're going to talk a little bit about um, sort of history and how these things uh, were created. Obviously, we're going to reference the Missoula floods, which sort of start up in here with glacial dams breaking during the ice ages in Idaho. Um, releasing water and flooding all the way down through what's called the Wallula Gap here in between Walla Walla and Yakima River and then flowing out from the Columbia River, dumping out into the Willamette Valley uh, and into the ocean. Pretty interesting stuff. Overview for the state of Washington. This is the second largest producing state in the United States and it represents about 5% of the U.S.'s total production. Um, I've seen some rapid expansion to it recently. Uh, there were about 160 wineries there in 1999, uh, and there's over 840 as of 2013. Washington really lacks um, bulk wine presence, like you see in the central coast of California. Uh, pardon me. Eric says he can't hear me. Can anybody else hear? Okay, I can hear. Great. Sorry, Eric. You have to double check your computer. All right. Um, as I was saying, no bulk wine presence um, like you see in California, especially in the Central Coast. Um, you got a few big players here, and um, we'll talk about those, but mainly Washington's built by um, really smaller wineries. There's sort of a winery and a vineyard disconnect, um, and that plays into the part because of the Cascade Mountains and the arid eastern side, uh, where there's a lot of population in the western portion of the, the state in Seattle. Um, you also see a lot of small um, tasting rooms in the area of Woodenville. And then as a whole, Washington State has about 5,000 more vineyard acres um, than Napa Valley, which is pretty interesting to note. Historically, prohibition from both state and federal really crushed the industry um, starting in the early uh, teens, 19 teens, and stretching through um, 1933 when it was lifted. Uh, Oregon statehood in 1859, Washington in 1889, and Idaho in 1890. Uh, really, with Washington, Walter Clore is uh, considered the, the father of Washington wine. He got started in 1937 at Washington University. Um, we founded Associated Vintners in Columbia, uh, excuse me, uh, in 1962, which today is Columbia Winery. Um, you also see later American wine growers uh, uh, started in 1967. Uh, that is now Chateau Saint-Michel, famously consulted by uh, Andre Chelyshev. Uh, the Washington State Liquor Control Board uh, was the sole wholesaler until 1969. It's sort of like Pennsylvania and Iowa, where all of the state liquor stores are, or all the liquor stores are state-run, essentially. There really haven't been any phylloxera outbreaks uh, when it comes to Washington. And as we mentioned before, uh, you saw a large increase uh, in growth to 840 wineries in 2013. There were only 19 wineries in the state in 1981. So a pretty small amount. Geography, we mentioned the Cascade Mountains, creating that, uh, that giant rain shadow for the Columbia Valley and the Columbia Basin. Uh, the Rocky Mountains blocking polar air from the north. Um, the Puget Sound to the west gets about 80 inches per year of rain. Yakima gets only about eight inches. So it's really an arid climate in the eastern portion of the state. Uh, we did mention Woodenville. It's sort of the nexus for wine trade and tasting rooms. And then um, in the valley, the Tri-Cities area and Prosser are the primary towns that you'll, you'll see. We sort of touched on earlier the Missoula floods, but we'll get a little bit more in depth here. Um, if you look up Missoula floods online too. There's a really great website that you can go to that shows sort of a gif. I wish it was a gif because I could have put it in the presentation. 
uh, but it shows the flow of how everything uh, cut across. So this happened between 17 and 6 million years ago during the Miocene epoch. There were volcanic eruptions that created basalt lava flows all through eastern Washington and Idaho. Then you get post-glacial constant flooding of Lake Missoula, which follows between 18 and 12,000 years ago. At some point, the flood discharge on occasion exceeded 10 times the combined flow of all modern rivers. Yes, all modern rivers. It's a tons and tons and tons of water. Um, so here, elevation is, is needed really to escape the cold air trapped in the valley floors. Your vineyards uh, typically sit above 900 feet. I'm um, in a sunny northern growing area and climate with very cold uh, winters. Pacific Ocean, you get cool wind that flows in through the Columbia Gorge. You get extended sunlight from the northern latitude. Some of the summers in the eastern part of Washington can reach up to 103 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the average Columbia Valley diurnal shift is about 28 degrees Fahrenheit, and some low areas can get to 40 degrees or more. It's pretty uh, impressive. Uh, the cold winters provide sort of pest resistance, although they can be harmful um, to the vine itself. And so here you'll see dual trunk training to avoid those winter freeze losses. Uh, and then we mentioned rainfall is pretty scarce in eastern Washington, about 6 to 12 inches in a very arid climate. Those ancient volcanic eruptions that left that massive plate of basalt. Um, we mentioned the Missoula floods bottlenecking there at the Wallula Gap, depositing sedimentary soils. So here you get exposed basalt above 1,200 feet and then sediment below that in varying depths. You also see a lot of windblown loess soils that are prominent here. And these are known as Aeolian, named after uh, the Greek god Aeolus uh, of wind. Grape varieties in the state of Washington are about 50-50 uh, white and red. Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Syrah, and Cabernet Franc uh, dominate the red varieties. For white, you see Chardonnay, Riesling, Pinot Gris, and Sauvignon Blanc, and this is in descending order of parent, uh, plantings. I think we have another question. Let's see what it says. Oh, that one's good. All right, cool. Washington AVAs that aren't in that Columbia Valley, um, you get the Puget Sound to the far west. It's wet, rainy, and you get a lot of hybrids, not a lot of vinifera. And then you get the Columbia Gorge, and this is an interesting area. Um, this is where the uh, Mosula floods really dumped out from the Wallula Gap there to the east. Um, it is the windsurfing capital of the United States. It's a beautiful area. It's shared between Washington, Oregon, um, right there on the Columbia River. Um, if you have an opportunity to go check it out, I would certainly say do so. There's a ton of different styles of wines here. It's also sort of the craft uh, beer capital of the U.S. as well. Um, and you can see it, this is the wine folly map. You can see the Columbia Gorge right down here. Pretty cool. I like this map a little bit better than I do the Giltzong map just because I like uh, the layout of it. Uh, but of course you can take your, your pick. Uh, here you can see the major cities. I think it's always important to note. Uh, you see Yakima, Prosser, the Tri-Cities area that we talked about. Um, Spokane, right, in eastern Washington. And of course, West of the Cascades, you have Seattle, and just northeast of that is Woodenville for the tasting rooms area. And this is the Puget Sound AVA uh, that sits to the west. You also see Mount Rainier and Mount St. Helens here, pretty important. But within Columbia Valley, this is where we're going to focus today. Uh, we're going to start in the north with Lake Chelan. We'll talk about ancient lakes, the Waluk Slope, Natchez Heights here. The Yakima Valley, which has sub-AVAs listed within it of Rattlesnake Hills, Snipes Mountain, and Red Mountain. And then we'll get to Horse Heaven Hills and Walla Walla, uh, which surround that Wallula Gap area. Um, I broke it down like this, and I hope this is a, a good visual learning tool for you to take a look at how the AVAs sit. Um, you know, as we mentioned, we start in the north with Lake Chelan, really a cool climate. Pinot Noir is sort of up and coming here. Yeah, Pinot Noir in Washington, pretty cool. Um, ancient lakes of Columbia Valley, really the white wines are dominating the, the landscape in this cool area also. Um, Natchez Heights, I mean, it, it matters. I don't know why I put that, it's probably wrong, but it, it's new, so make sure you're familiar with it. Uh, the Waluk Slope, uh, the, the E is silent on the end of it. This is where Syrah sort of becomes king. The Yakima Valley here, and it's sub- uh, or nested AVAs of Rattlesnake Hills. A lot of people don't use the Rattlesnake Hills uh, AVA. They typically prefer to, to utilize Yakima Valley still. 
Um, Snipes Mountain, this is the first of the different plantings were here in the early 1900s. Uh, and Red, Red Mountain to the east. This is the smallest AVA uh, in Washington, but it is perhaps the, uh, one of the most important. Cabernet is really king and the eastern edge of Yakima Valley here, it gets extremely warm. So this is the warmest one too. You get further east, you find Walla Walla Valley, which of course bleeds over into Oregon. You can see a little bit there, um, which has within it in the Oregon side, the rocks at Milton Freewater. Uh, super uh, interesting up and coming area for Rhone varieties, famous uh, for Syrah. And then Horse Heaven Hills here, it's an important area, but very few wineries. There's a ton of vineyards. Um, and so these people sell to a lot of, um, a lot of producers too. And then just a little further information about each of these. I tried to pack a lot of info into this particular slide, but Columbia Valley um, established in 1984 as an AVA covers over 95% of the vinifer vineyards, 11 million acres. It is massive, right? Uh, the Yakima Valley within it uh, sits on the Yakima River, interestingly enough, right? It's the third largest AVA in the area. Uh, is over 70% of the nation's hops are grown here. This is hop country. Uh, and in fact, I've got a, a buddy of mine that did hop harvest there a few years ago, and I would certainly recommend if you're into, into craft beer to, to visit the area for both wine and beer. Most of your vineyards uh, sit here between 1,000 and 1,400 feet above sea level. Uh, we mentioned the Red Mountain being the state's hottest AVA. Um, pioneers here were Kiona and Seal de Cheval. You also have uh, Col Solari, um, Force Majeure, and Upchurch. Here you have a higher pH and you have a little bit more nitrogen poor soils. There's some dense and impactful, powerful Cabernet Sauvignons that come out of the area. Snipes Mountain to the, white, uh, to the west is an anticline. And so a lot of what you see here in the Columbia Valley are inclines and anticlines that are left from those Missoula floods. Um, in the case of Snipes Mountain, it's an anticline. It's slightly larger than Red Mountain. You have a minimum of 750 feet above sea level on the southern slope and 820 feet uh, on the northern slope. And the summit here is about 1,310 feet. Um, Upland actually owns about three quarters of the acres that are planted on Snipes Mountain. Rattlesnake Hills, established in 2006, sits between 850 and about 1,600 feet in range. We mentioned um, sort of the difficulties. You don't see a whole lot of bottlings uh, labeling Rattlesnake Hills. And the Walla Walla Valley to the east, established in 1984, we're going to talk a little bit about this. The easternmost nested AVA of the Columbia Valley. Two thirds of it are in Washington, one third in Oregon. It translates in a local dialect to many waters due to the confluence of the three rivers here, Columbia, Walla Walla, and Snake, and then of course the Wallula Gap. On the eastern border, uh, you find the Blue Mountains. Here you sit between four and two, excuse me, 400 and 2,000 feet. Um, although anywhere below 850, you start to run into risks of uh, frost damage. Uh, there are two potential subregions beyond uh, the rocks at Milton Freewater, North Fork um, and Mill Creek are both sort of on the eastern edge near the Blue Mountains where rainfall is considerably higher. Uh, this place is covered in windblown sand or loess, right? Uh, it's a great region for onions. Uh, Gary Figgins planted vinifer here in 74 and then founded Leonetti in 1977. Uh, you'll find Lacole, Leonetti, Woodward Canyon, Cayuse, Pepper Bridge, Waters, I should say Waters, not Watery, uh, and Gramercy Cellars. It's also home to Vinea, uh, the Wine Growers Sustainable Trust. Uh, and here in the Pacific Northwest, we'll talk a little bit further about LIVE, which is another um, uh, certification board for sustainable wine growing. Um, you see a lot more of this in the Pacific Northwest. There's a, a lot more attention to sustainability and giving back to Mother Earth. Um, next to AVA, Horse Heaven Hills in 2005, uh, another anticline. It's a lot of wind and very few trees. So it's a big flat area. Um, well, not flat, a big area without trees. So you get a lot of wind to it. Um, it the elevation gap here is from 200 to about 1,800 feet. Uh, Waluk Slope from 425 to about 1,480 feet. The Saddle Mountains to the north, very deep, well-drained, and again, wind-blown sands. This translates to watering hole, but it is the driest AVA in Washington, and again, a great spot for Syrah. Uh, Lake Chelan in the north, um, it's the only region not really affected by the uh, Missoula floods. 
um, this glacial lake right there that really helps to moderate the temps. And then we mentioned with Natchez Heights, uh, there's only a handful of vineyards at this point. A handful of single vineyard sites that I think are important to know, um, just for your own personal edification, you might see these labeled and it would be good for you to know immediately what AVA they sit within. Uh, I think important ones in Red Mountain, the Sildes Reval for sure, um, in Horse Heaven Hills, Shampoo Vineyard, certainly, in Walla Walla Valley, uh, beyond Pepper Bridge, but all the Cayuse ones, Cayu, Armada, on Cerise, on Chamberlain, uh, and then Lake Lean. In the Yakima Valley, there's a famous one called Red Willow. Waluke Slope has River Bend, and Columbia Valley's famous large one is Lewis Vineyard. It's really big. And there's a few uh, unincorporated vineyards that sort of sit outside of AVAs. You find um, Sagemoor and Cold Creek, um, sort of selling to all the big players are owned, in this case, of Cold Creek, a monopole of St. Michelle Estates, uh, and then Stillwater Creek as well. Key producers, um, Chateau St. Michel kind of rules the day. I mean, 60% of Washington's production uh, is Chateau St. Michel. It's the largest producer of Riesling in the world, which is kind of crazy. Uh, then you have Columbia Winery, which was purchased, of course, by Gallo. Um, other key producers, though, Leonetti uh, and Figgins, which gave Merlot a great rep, uh, known for their Bordeaux varieties. Uh, the Betts family, of course, Bob Betts, uh, M.W., he worked for Chef de St. Michel for 20-some years before he, uh, he opened Betts uh, in the mid-1990s. He's really sort of seen the entire growth of Washington wine from day one almost. Waters and, and 21 Grams, there's actually a Guild podcast, um, which is pretty interesting on these guys. Cayuse, which really put the rocks on the map. Uh, Colsetta Creek, of course, the most expensive wine and the first 100-point wine out of Washington. I think it was the 2002 vineyard, vintage, excuse me. Uh, Rain Van, if you like a uh, really interesting old world style of Rhones. Uh, and then, of course, Gramercy, uh, Master Sommelier, Greg Harrington with his uh, project there. Super cool wines. That's my story on Washington for today. We're going to move a little further south. Uh, we see a lot of the same things here, right? You see the Hood River. This is where the Columbia Gorge is. Um, here's the Columbia River that comes out. This is that little area, that little purple dot is the rocks of Milton Freewater within the Walla Walla AVA on the uh, southern side in Oregon. Um, and then, you know, probably most important, we see these cascades cut through here. And in Washington, of course, your wine growing regions are east of the cascades. They're arid, it's hot. And in Oregon, it's quite different. You're west of the cascades here. Um, you get rainfall, but a lot of that happens in the winter time. Um, you get some pretty uh, water retentive soils here. It's great for growing Pinot Noir. There's three parallel valleys that run from the north to the south. There's the Willamette Valley, um, the Umpqua Valley, and the Rogue Valley, and they each get their names from the rivers that sit with them. Willamette, the Umpqua, and the Rogue River here. We're going to focus obviously mainly on the nested AVAs of Willamette Valley. This particular map from Guildsom is actually missing an AVA. In 2018, the Van Duzer AVA was approved. Uh, we'll take a look at that on a, uh, a wine folly map here in just a second. So, of course, Willamette rhymes with damn it. Valley is approximately 80% of Oregon's production. Um, it's a smaller rural area than Washington or the Central Valley in California. It's the third largest producer of wine in the U.S. and the fourth uh, most vineyard acreage after the New York uh, area. Pinot Noir and Pinot Gris make up about three quarters of the plantings. And again, we mentioned most of the vineyards are west of the Cascades here. History, uh, 1847, Henderson Llewellyn uh, brought a wealth of American vine cuttings. A.R. Shipley imported both American and vinifera in the 1860s. The really modern history begins in the 1960s when David Lett and Charles Curry um, come north from California and create Irie Vineyards in the Dundee Hills and then Shehalem Mountain AVA boundary, respectively. Um, Curry was more intent on modernization and approachability of wines, led a bit more thought-provoking and artisanal. Uh, David Adelsheim, of course, showed up in 72, uh, Dick and Rath and Ponzi in 69 and 70. Um, but David Lett's participation in wine competitions in Burgundy um, attracting the attention of Robert Druin with South Block Pinot Noir was somewhat victorious, getting second and third places. Um, and then he decided to take it off the market after that, pretty interestingly enough. 
Uh, Robert's daughter, uh, Veronique Druin's first vintage was in 1988. Geographically, the coastal range shelters the northern part of the Willamette Valley here. You have the Cascades to the east, you have Columbia River and Washington uh, to the north. Portland and Salem really encompass the heart of the wine growing territory, um, but of course the Willamette Valley is a little bit further south of Portland. Uh, we mentioned the three parallel valleys. Uh, on average, you're on the 45th parallel here, you're lower elevation than your Washington vineyards. Typically, three to 900 feet is a bit more ideal. Um, as we get to the Chehalem Mountains within Willamette Valley, we'll discuss the Tualatin River as well. Climatically, um, cool, temperate climate, unlike the east of the Cascades where it's arid and has temperature extremes. Um, you get Pacific winds, very cool, that are brought in through that Van Duzer corridor, corridor excuse me, affecting Van Duzer uh, and McMinnville specifically. More moderate climate than Washington. You'll see some dry farming. Um, you have a very similar climate to Burgundy. It is a region one, but you get slightly more rain in Oregon during the winter months, less during the growing season. Um, you rarely see hail or rot. Um, and you see a slightly longer growing season. So they, they did a study recently that shows that bud break happens about a week earlier in Willamette and beration happens about five to seven days later. We sort of talked about Vinaya um, and the Wine Grower Sustainable Trust in Washington. We need to mention live too, which is low input, viticulture and enology. Fa founded by Ted Castile of Bethel Heights and Carmo Vasconcelos of Oregon State University in 1997. I said that name with a lot of confidence and I have no idea if I pronounced it correctly. I just want you to know that. Uh, committed here to a reduction in overall raw materials, which means less water, less chemicals, less fertilizers, less pesticides, hopefully none. Um, here you can utilize the live logo in Oregon since 99 or Washington since 2006. If the winery is live certified and at least 97% of uh, grapes come from a live certified vineyard. There are, however, pest and disease issues. And you know, we said there's not as much rot as burgundy, but that doesn't mean that it's not there. Um, you still find powdery mildew and some botrytis can certainly be issues. Birds can cause problems as they're in the mag migratory pathway. You also find grape rust mites. And then a big one whenever you're in the vineyard sites in Willamette Valley that people like to talk about are gophers and voles. Now we didn't see phylloxera here until the 1990s. Uh, but because in Oregon you have a better water retentive soil, you don't see as much tilling in the vineyard sites, which helps to reproduce phylloxera and nematodes and things of that uh, nature. Uh, side note on phylloxera, something I had no idea until I was in Ribbon Ridge at Beaufrere, uh, at the Beaufrere Vineyard. Um, it actually takes several years to fully destroy a vineyard. And in fact, the fruit becomes quite concentrated and yields are really, really low over time. So it's more of a question about quantity and quality um, before you decide to rip out your vineyards and replant because of phylloxera. With the Beaufrere vineyard, at the time that I was there in 2015, it was probably right at the tail end of what they were gonna let it live to. They had dealt with phylloxera in the vineyard for about seven to 10 years, uh, but they were really, really impressed with the quality of, and density of the fruit that was coming out. It was really, really highly concentrated and delicious. They weren't able to make as much, um, but they thought that it was some of the best wines that they had been making in a while. Uh, soils you'll find here really um, broken down into uh, uplifted marine sediment, volcanic soils, loess, which of course is windblown, and then Masula flood deposits. Uh, with the uplifted marine sediment, um, the two typical ones are called Willikinsey and belt pine. These are sandier and a little thinner. They typically produce darker style of Pinot Noirs. Uh, for volcanics, you find Jory and Nekia. Jory is that red volcanic soil. It stains your shoes when you walk in the vineyards. Nekia is a little more friable brown with hints of red. I wanted to sh throw up a couple pictures that I'd taken in the past, but unfortunately with modern cameras, the red eye reduction reduces all the color of any red soils you ever take. It kills me. Uh, they both tend to hold water a little bit better and lend to a lighter style of Pinot Noir. Um, that windblown lows here is known as laurel wood. And then uh, you'll find Masula flood deposits referred to as wood burn. They're typically better for agriculture outside of, of grapes. Uh, you'll see them with other, other styles. And you really don't find any limestone or marl in the Willamette Valley, which separates it completely uh, from what you see in Burgundy, right? Uh, grape varieties and wine styles 
hey, look, it's Pinot Noir, right? Pinot Noir and Gris make up three quarters of the plantings. Um, here you see Pinot Gris, Chardonnay, Riesling, and Pinot Blanc too. Although there's pockets of Milan de Bourgogne, and people thought it was Pinot Blanc uh, in the 1970s. Primarily, you see still wine production here uh, with sparkling production attracting some attention in recent years. Obviously, um, what uh, Roland Scholz is doing at Argyle and back in the days uh, were pretty fantastic. And I think that's still probably the benchmark for sparkling wine uh, when it comes to the Willamette Valley. But you're starting to see others take a, take a run at it too. Some of the older producers too, Elk Cove is making some delicious sparkling wines. Uh, you can find them out there, that's for sure. Similar to what we did with the Columbia Valley, I wanted to give you a little bit of a visual look at, uh, at how the AVAs break down in this way. And then we can always skip back over here to take a look at these things. So uh, we start with the Dundee Hills, which is home to the original Irie Vineyard, um, home to um, Drew Ann. It's a very delicate style, known for the Jory soils. And we can take a look here. Bam. Here's your Dundee Hills right here in the middle. And I think it's important to note um, Van Duzer, I guess, isn't on here yet. I really thought it was. I'm kind of bummed about that. Uh, Shehala Mountains, um, more mixed soils here. Uh, originally, this was, we mentioned Charles Curry, but also Ponzi, Adelsheim, and Arath. Uh, within the Shehala Mountains, you've got a little spur that splits off. That's the Ribbon Ridge AVA, where, of course, um, as I mentioned, both rare as well as uh, Brickhouse are. And it's kind of hard to see. I mean, it's a little tiny, but it's right here. Little bitty tiny guy. Cool. Uh, Yamhill Carlton, um, this is sort of a, a horseshoe area with Penner Ash and Elk Cove, famous for the Shea Vineyard. Uh, you see a lot more of those Willa Kinsey soils here, so those uplifted sediments. Uh, McMinnville in the south, very windy. Um, it, it's got very few wineries. You see a lot of tasting rooms in this area. And it's windy because of all that um, Van Duzer corridor wind blowing in. The Eola Amity Hills. Um, this is where you'll find more of those Nekia soils, that friable brown uh, volcanic. Uh, famous for Brooks, Christum, and Bethel Heights. And then uh, the Van Duzer Corridor, the newest AVA established in 2018. A lot of that marine sedimentary, this area is cold and windy. Uh, for a while, they thought it was a little bit too cold. The other cool thing about this map is that it shows Idaho uh, with Snake River Valley. There's also Lewis and Clark AVA that kind of stretches up across and then you get Eagle, uh, I think it's called Eagle Pass Foot Hills. We'll talk about that. Uh, and then of course, we're gonna get into um, Southern Oregon too, which I think is critical. Now, Umpqua Valley and Rogue Valley were established in 1984 and 1991 as AVAs. Southern Oregon didn't come along until 2006, and it's a, an umbrella AVA that covers all of it. Um, it's really used for, I mean, there's a lot of fruit that comes out of the south that moves into wineries in the north, too. Uh, oh, here we go. Southern Oregon, I'm sorry, it was 2004, not 2006. Uh, Richard Summer came here from California in 1961, planted some Pinot Noir vineyards um, and really got it started right next to like Cabernet, if I recall correctly. Um, in Umpqua Valley, um, King Estate really dominates the landscape here. Uh, the winery is located outside the ABA. You also though find Elkton, Oregon uh, is a cool and wet area and then Red Hills, Douglas County. There's a handful of wineries, but as an extension of that volcanic jewelry soil. Uh, and then in the south, the warmest AVA in Oregon is the Rogue Valley. It's the driest area west of the Cascades. Within it, you've got one official AVA and then a couple of unofficial areas. The Applicate AVA established in 2000, the highest points of viticulture in Oregon, almost 2,000 feet. Then you have the Illinois Valley, which is further west to the coast, and it's sort of uh, in the shadow of the Klamath Mountains. And these reach like seven to 8,000 feet and create a true rain shadow here. Uh, and then Bear Creek, which is site of the, the gold rush in the 1850s. These are important areas to be aware of. There's some great up and coming areas. Um, in fact, I've got a buddy that bought uh, a vineyard in Southern Oregon. I look forward to, to seeing it with him soon. I wanted to throw on a few uh, legal things as far as wine labeling is concerned because the Pacific Northwest is a bit more restrictive in certain areas. Um, if a label lists an AVA, a minimum of 85% of grapes used to produce the wine must have originated in the state, in the stated region, excuse me. 
Uh, if producers choose to label their wines by county, state, or country in the U.S., instead, the minimum is lowered to 75%. Now, California, Washington, and Oregon are the exceptions. Uh, wine labeled, wines labeled as California or just Oregon are required to be made 100% of grapes grown in the state. Uh, whereas wines labeled as Washington must contain at least 95% of grapes grown in the state. And that's probably due in fact, um, due in part, excuse me, to the fact that Walla Walla and Columbia Valley sort of stretch a little bit into the Idaho, Oregon areas too. Uh, wines labeled by single vineyard though must contain a minimum 95% of the grapes grown in the stated vineyard. This is important to note for all those single vineyards that I pointed out uh, earlier in the presentation. Varietal wines from Oregon, excluding those produced from white and red Bordeaux varieties, major grape, uh, uh, Rhone grapes, Zinfandel, Sangiovese, Tanan, Tempranillo, yeah, that's a lot, must contain a minimum of 90% of the stated variety rather than the standard 75%. Basically, what this is saying is that Pinot Noir you know, Blanc, some of these important varieties, Chardonnay, have to contain at least 90% of the stated variety. Oregon also maintains stricter state laws for labeling by a region. A wine labeled by an AVA within Oregon must contain a minimum 95% of the grapes grown in the respective appellation, rather than the 85% mandated by federal law. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to at least have the one slide on Idaho. Early vinifera plantings, uh, were really snuffed out by prohibition. Wine grapes completely disappeared from Idaho until a Snake River Valley vineyard was planted in 1970. And the Snake River Valley AVA was approved in 2007, stretches across Idaho and Oregon, as you saw. But the Eagle Foothills AVA is the only Idaho-only AVA, and it was approved in 2015. And then you get the Lewis and Clark AVA approved in 2016, which stretches across Idaho and Washington. That's my show for the day. Uh, I hope that this presentation helps to uh, clarify what's going on in the Pacific Northwest, break down some things, not too granular, but uh, to at least explain why the wines taste the way that they do. Um, and I hope you guys can grab a glass of some wine from the Pac Northwest uh, here with some friends and family soon. Uh, we'll be back next week. Um, I'll take a look at the syllabus and uh, we'll see you all next Sunday. Cheers.